Okay, uh, hello everybody. My name's Kevin Rowan. I'm Head of Organising Skills at, at the TUC and I'm chairing uh, the, this afternoon's session on uh, Winning for Workers Lessons from a, a, a Joint Union Campaign, which is going to be the story of how uh, some of our unions have been working together uh, with ourselves and Uni Global to, uh, uh, to organise and secure uh, improvements in terms and conditions for workers in, in ISS. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that we've got uh, some, some terrific speakers lined up this afternoon, but just to uh, uh, alert colleagues, one of our panellists, Donna Raw Merriman from Unison, has had to pull out of the event today because she's had a, a, a bit of a family emergency uh, this morning. But we do have uh, two terrific speakers who I'll introduce uh, shortly. Uh, just a, a couple of housekeeping things uh, first. Uh, firstly, uh, the, I have to point out that the, the, the chat facility uh, isn't working. So if anybody wants to say hi to uh, other people uh, in the room, uh, then do, you do use the, the, the kind of Q&A slot. Uh, and also, if you do want to kind of raise any questions or make any comments during the discussion part of the seminar, then the Q&A slot is where uh, you can post those, uh, those questions and comments. Uh, and Craig from the TUC will be moderating those and feeding those uh, questions into the panelists after we've had uh, the presentations. Uh, just as usual at kind of trade union events, we uh, expect and hope everyone uh, you know, uh, conducts themselves in, 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 in the right way. We fully expect people to, that's the kind of thing we, we normally kind of experience, but just in case uh, anyone's in any doubt, uh, we don't accept any, uh, any racist or sexist or discriminatory language any form of abuse. Uh, if anybody does kind of cross that line, then we will be removing them from the call. Uh, and Craig is going to post the uh, the TUC code of conduct in the chat box so that people understand exactly uh, exactly what the ex expectations are. Uh, our two speakers uh, that I'll be introducing shortly. First, we'll hear from uh, Mark Bergfeld, who's the uh, Director of Property uh, services and other things at Uni Global, and he's been working brilliantly, I think, with uh, the TUC and trade unions as part of this campaign. Uh, and then we'll be hearing from uh, Kate Leslie, who's been very much on the front line of this campaign, uh, PCS uh, branch activist and organizer uh, based in the uh, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and someone who's been absolutely on the front line doing a terrific job in, uh, in winning for workers in ISS. This has been a campaign that as a TUC, we've been involved in for about kind of 12 months, 18 months or so, uh, bringing together a, a range of unions, including, uh, as well as PCS, we've got Unison, GMB, Unite, uh, and RMT, ISS, one of them companies that has a big footprint right across the uh, uh, public and private sector. Uh, bringing together those unions to uh, uh, cooperate, uh, share good experience, collaborate in some areas, and uh, seeing and working really together to put as much pressure as we can on the company to recognize unions, to uh, engage with unions positively, uh, and to make sure that workers get the best deal that they can in this company. Uh, at that point, I think I'm gonna hand over to Mark. Mark's gonna to talk to us for about kind of 12, 13 minutes or so uh, around uh, some of the kind of issues around how ISS operates and some of the uh, ways in which Uni Global have been helping support the campaign. Thanks, Mark, and over to you. Hello, everyone. I hope all of you are doing good and keeping healthy and uh, trying the best possible to make sure that you don't catch the ongoing coronavirus. And it's great uh, that Kevin from the TUC invited me to speak. And it's also great to share a platform with Kate uh, whom I met, I think it must have been like a year ago now, uh, you know, when uh, base cleaners and security uh, guards uh, were on strike and I reached out to them and said, hey, like what, you know, do you need any help uh, in understanding in understanding ISS? I hope that people can see my screen presentation now. Is, can people see it? I see nods. Okay. So what I'll do quickly is I'll talk about the UK cleaning industry. Uh, ISS business model, like where does ISS fit into the cleaning industry and what can our trade union responses, uh, responses be? And I think, uh, I think the presentation will be helpful to understand how do we organize uh, a predominantly migrant and women workforce? How do we 
organize some of the most precarious workers and take on big multinational companies organizing across different, different sectors. So just a bit of background about Uni Global Union and Uni Europa, the European office of Uni that I, that I work for as a director, uh, representing workers in the cleaning and security sector. So first and foremost, uh, we try to hold multinational uh, companies accountable to their global framework agreements. And ISS is one of those companies that has signed a global framework agreement in which they actually commit themselves to uh, granting access to trade unions, to workplaces, in which they say that they will abide by the ILO conventions on the freedom of association and uh, various and various other legal mechanisms. And there's also a disputes resolution mechanism enshrined in that global framework agreement. And ultimately it also ensures that unions, when there are issues across different countries and whether they're in the global south where ISS also operates, uh, or whether they are in the, in the UK, that uh, that we can address them with central management and not just uh, with country management. And what else we're involved in is in monitoring and analyzing the com uh, company developments. And at the European level, I primarily uh, I primarily engage in that by looking at all the annual reports, the investor reports, and trying to do that. And uh, as part of that role, I also sit as an expert for trade unions on the European Works Council, uh, which is an information consultation body where the UK trade unions are also represented and have, a, and have a voice. And ultimately, the most important thing is trying to really build solidarity with cleaners unions across Europe and across the globe, training new leaders and organizers in developing the kind of strategies and tactics uh, that will ultimately mean that workers in the cleaning sector uh, and, and facility services sector have better terms, wages, and conditions uh, wherever they might uh, wherever they might work. Um, as part of our work uh, at the European and global level, we have an ISS trade union network in which unions, all the way from Indonesia to the United States uh, part, they participate in. And it's a really, it's a forum to exchange knowledge between unions and try to increase participation in the European Works Council and also try to promote, uh, try to, to promote a global client organizing uh, approach. And I'll come back to that later. I'll come back to that later. So I think the first thing to talk about is the cleaning and facility service market in the in the U, in the UK, and the basic problems that we that we have there. The first issue is is that there's 32,000 companies that provide cleaning services in the UK. They provide cleaning services in schools, in public, uh, like in Bay uh, institutions such as Bay's, in hospitals, uh, but as well to private clients such as banks, shops. Etc. In many cases, these kinds of companies are actually a man and a mop, so to speak, just, you know, self-employed, so-called self-employed workers trying to, you know, get by, register a small little company, and you don't need a lot of startup capital to start, uh, to start a company like that. Um, and in the very few cases, we are actually dealing with companies such as ISS, which counts 500,000 employees across, uh, across the world. In most cases, it's small and medium sized, sized enterpri enterprises. And the problem with that being is, is that unlike in traditional, uh, in traditional sectors that the trade union movement has been very strong in, such as like the auto industry, or, you know, or manufacturing, there's no barriers to entry because you don't need to invest into capital and wages are so low within the cleaning sector that it's all ultimately also very easy to find, you know, to find workers who will do these jobs as well as you, all, you don't need to put that much money uh, up front. So there's a basic problem for, the, for us as unions is like, how do we tackle such an unregulated sector and, ind and, and industry 
where we're dealing with 32,000 uh, 32, different, uh, different companies. And the basic proposition is the following. If you take the traditional kind of like organizing approach in manufacturing, it's like, okay, we have an employer, the employer is Rolls Royce or it's, uh, or it's uh, BMW or it's whatever kind of car company. And we, we try to organize, we try to organize the shop and we try to organize the shop and we try to organize the workplace. In most cases, we try to actually establish sectoral, sectoral collective agreements rather than just have company, uh, company agreements so that workers within the car industry, for example, as a whole, have certain, stand, have certain wages across the board, have certain health and safety standards across the board, have certain benefits across the board, and that companies are not, uh, can't compete on the cost of labor. The problem in the cleaning industry is, is that we actually have what we call a triangular employment relationship. Because we have the employer, which is ISS or uh, cleaning company X, but we also have the client that actually has subcontracted uh, the cleaning work to, to that company. Now, that relationship means is the client, whether that's the NHS or whether that's a bank like Barclays Bank, which uh, subcontracts cleaning, also has a responsibility actually to monitor the cleaning contract, has a responsibility to make sure that uh, these workers are paid a decent wage and that their wage theft isn't occurring. They need to also make sure that on their premises, uh, certain health and safety standards are abided by, et cetera. But what we often have is a situation due to the discourse of like new public management that many of you will be familiar with or due to the fact that big banks want to reduce labor costs and overhead costs is that these clients think once they've subcontracted or outsourced cleaning services, it's no longer our, responsi it's no longer our responsibility. And that really puts us into, uh, as unions, into a difficult situation. Because when you're talking about ISS, most people, if you in the public, don't think about the cleaning company, but think about the International Space Station. If you talk about, you know, large cleaning companies such as Facilicom, uh, which has numerous contracts in the city of London, most people don't even know these companies but they will actually know the clients that they're working for. They will know Bayes in, uh, in, in the UK. They will know Goldman Sachs. They will know, you know, Barclays, Barclays Bank. So the question is, is like, where do we actually uh, put, uh, put pressure there? And I'll come back to that in a minute later. Uh, Kevin, if I'm going over time, just, uh, just shut me up, right? Um, so what does the cleaning sector in the UK look like? And I've taken these figures uh, from the latest Eurofund study. Uh, Eurofund is the EU agency which tries to uh, create statistical data on all questions uh, regarding industrial relations and labor. And what we see is, is that half, nearly half a million uh, workers are employed in the cleaning in the cleaning sector in the UK. That's 1.4% of the total UK workforce. So not an insignificant section of workers are actually employed in this, in this sector. And the thing that really stands out is, is that it's 80% women and it's a mostly migrant, uh, migrant workforce or black, Asian, minority, ethnic workforce. And as you all will know, mostly cleaners you know, if you come new into a country, it's kind of the easiest job, uh, our job to get, uh, easy to enter, enter the labor market. So many of the workers we're trying to organize in the sector will not have the language skills, you know, and thus, you know, also will be afraid uh, to perhaps organize or also will face obstacles of, you know, making use of their rights, which, uh, which do, do exist. Um, and what we see is, is that another difficulty for us as unions is that 66% of workers in the cleaning sector are actually on part-time con 
are on part-time contracts. And in the UK, most cleaners will be working on a 13 hour work week contract. So that raises a problem. Do, you know, do these cleaners, and often when we, when we do trainings with cleaners, it's like, do they see themselves as being permanently in the cleaning workforce? And do they see it as necessary to, you know, to organize their workplace, to, you know, fight, fight for better rights, or is it, or do they just want to move on to a better job? And I've met many cleaners uh, through my, through my work, and it's often the case that, you know, lots of them are in education, you know, are doing other education courses, are, you know, uh, involved in, in other activities, trying to actually improve their life in those ways, those ways as well. But nonetheless, it's absolutely crucial that we try to uh, try to create a floor with, uh, within within that within that industry. The other issue, coming back to the triangular employment relationship that I mentioned before, is that 33% of the workforce has two employers, meaning that a cleaner might be employed on a 10-hour contract with company A and then you know move over in the afternoon to co company b and also work a couple of hours uh, hours for them and it's particularly difficult in the uk because a lot of companies have not signed up to daytime cleaning so what we see is, is that a lot of cle cleaners have split shifts so doing a shift in the morning while we're all still you know while we're all still asleep uh, and before the offices work, going into uh, going into and cleaning buildings and cleaning and cleaning during during the night, which means that effectively, if you have children or if you have older people to look after, that it makes it very difficult uh, to uh, to ensure that your family responsibilities are also taken taken uh, taken care taken care of. So. What does ISS's workforce look like? So we have like nearly 45,000 em employees and actually the gender breakdown of the total workforce, we nearly have 60% uh, women. And we see that amongst uh, in the very far uh, right corner under operatives, you see that 27% of the workforce in ISS in the UK is uh, Black, Asian, uh, minority, ethnic, compared to only 7% amongst the senior managers. And ISS continuously prides itself in, in diversity. And I think, you know, Kate can really tell the story of Bayes and what's, uh, and how they play on, uh, how they play on that and how they, you know, make it one of their kind of, la you know, like, outstanding characteristics, but at the same time actually do not treat their workers as they should be. And as we're talking about, you know, organizing and we're talking about, and we currently see uh, US workers, uh, you know, demanding uh, justice for black lives. I think it's really important that these are the kinds of workers that, you know, uh, require justice, and uh, it's exactly their lives that we're we're talking talking about here. So, what does ISS's business model then look like? In the, it looks in the following way. So, if you, and these are all uh, publicly available uh, slides. So, nothing nothing secret. It just takes you a you know a bit of research to find these. You see that. Um, ISS used to belong to Goldman Sachs for a very long time when it was not on the stock market. And back in, you know, to, I think it was in 2008 or a bit before that, it, it went public again and came back on the stock market. And what they said is, is like, in order to distinguish ourselves from, you know, like these 32,000 companies, which are a swamp, we actually need to not only provide cleaning services, but we need to provide integrated facility services uh, capabilities. So if there's an, a key account like Bayes, what we need to do is we need to provide, provide the porters, we need to provide postal room services, we need to provide security services, and we need to lock ourselves into the entire infrastructure of a client. And because uh, public uh, services are being outsourced, whether it's ca like catering as well, or whether it's 
banks like Barclays who actually want to concentrate on their core services. It means that there's a real business opportunity here for cleaning companies such as ISS to, to move up the value chain and to become bigger and bigger companies within other businesses in infrastructure. And so what they've done did is instead of just trying to in in the last two years is instead of trying to grow and take every possible uh, a cleaning contract that there is out there that they effectively concentrated on the very big clients so in the uk um, i have a list that i will show in a, in a bit and they which they call key accounts and those are the accounts in which you can make a particular uh, you can make a particular turnover, but you also can provide other services than just as cleaning. Because the problem, according to companies like ISS, or the problem for in in the cleaning sector, is is that eighty percent, uh, like roughly estimated, eighty percent of all uh, of your turnover per employee is is labor cost. So it's very high labor intensive intensive industry, and the margins for the companies, particularly if they're accountable to shareholders, are far too low. So you've got to squeeze more labor, and you've got to make sure that you also find other uh, revenue streams to move forward. And I think you know. Um, some of you will be familiar with the concept of facility management that you see where the red arrow points up. It includes what ISS moved into is cleaning, catering, support, security, as well as technical support. And of course, if you look at catering or if you look at security or if you look at technical IT support, of course, those are much higher value added activities. And that's really what they want uh, to be concentrating on in the future and in particular in markets like the UK where outsourcing uh, remains very uh, very dominant um, in public contracts and companies and companies also prefer to not pr provide these services in-house so what does that mean in terms of the hmm? the three minutes mark three minutes perfect Still three minutes yeah, yeah. So it really means that ISS is no longer simply competing with the kind of 32,000 other cleaning companies. It means that they're actually competing with other contractors, such as G4S, who also produ pr uh, provide facility ser and security services, with Sodexo or, or with Mighty. And actually, they're trying to tilt the power uh, between the contractor, who always is at the end of the line and put more and more pressure onto clients. So for example, they're trying to not only get a contract with Barclays in one bank branch, but they try to get the contract for its headquarters as well as all, as well as all the different services that need to be provided within, uh, within, um, within the bank branches, the headquarters, etc which of course means for us as unions that we can start putting put pressure onto companies like Barclays or put pressure onto companies at, like uh, Arriva or Deutsche Telekom or Amazon or, or even public services such as the NHS to provide cleaners with better working conditions uh, as well as uh, better, term, uh, better terms and conditions as, as a whole. So where does that leave us in terms of where does it leave us in terms of organizing? It effectively means we need to start to adopt a client-based organizing strategy, because if you just target ISS, it means and you push up the wages, for example, and you win improved wages for uh, for the next you know two years. It often means that ISS will want will not want to continue the contract or will ultimately lose the contract to some other company that is undercutting, undercutting them. So we actually need to target the, the client company, whether, whatever client that is, whether it's public or private, to say like, you need to, uh, you need to actually provide decent terms, conditions, wages as uh, to the cleaners. That should mean daytime cleaning, decent wages, et cetera. And for the public services, 
of course, uh, in the UK, there's, uh, you know, there should, they should be provided uh, in-house. So I think that that really leaves you with a good kind of overview of how the cleaning market operates, as well as like what the challenges for unions are, but as well as with the very simple like and straightforward solution that we as unions can adopt in the future, which is to try to use our, the, these, this new market concentration that exists in the cleaning sector to really target, uh, to really target the big scale, uh, big scale clients of these companies and ensure that uh, cleaners and some of the lowest paid workers within our economies actually have decent uh, working terms and, con and, and conditions. Brilliant, thank you uh, very much, Mark. I mean, there's, there's so much kind of information and in intelligence in there and in, in many ways painting a very kind of difficult organizing challenge uh, for unions. Uh, just to uh, let the kind of attendees know uh, that the, the kind of information and the presentations are all being recorded and our intention is to kind of share these on, on YouTube once the kind of all of the organizing festival is finished. So, so don't feel you need to take copious notes during, uh, during the session, the information will be available uh, afterwards. But that was a picture of, uh, uh, of an immensely difficult organizing challenge uh, that, that Max uh, painted. Uh, and one actually which unions are responding to and winning and in that, uh, in that vein, I'm really delighted to be able to uh, uh, introduce Kate, who's been working uh, for PCS uh, in, in doing just that, in recruiting those, uh, uh, those vulnerable workers, those migrant workers, those women workers, and winning for them in the workplace. So Kate, really pleased you could join us, uh, and the floor's all yours. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we're I good. apologise few tech uh, problems, mainly because I'm a civil servant and therefore technological idiot. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you to Kevin and the TUC for organising this. Um, and great to have Mark here. Uh, Mark and I have worked together quite a lot over the last year. So um, a big thanks to Uniglobal and Mark as well. So look, what I thought I'd cover is our dispute um, who we are, obviously, our dispute, what we won, and then just a couple of thoughts and reflections in terms of what we learnt, what we're doing going forward, but a couple of thoughts and reflections as trade unionists and the labour movement and wider um, in the UK of what we can do. So look who we are. I'm a branch rep in, um, I'm also a civil servant. I work in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in Whitehall. So I work in the main HQ where the Secretary of State is. Um, and so do most of my workers. ISS and Aramark are the two component main contractors for Bay. So ISS providing facilities management and Aramark provide our catering. We have another couple of smaller contractors. Um, and where do we come from? So I am actually an ex-decker. So we were the Department for Energy and Climate Change. And when climate change was sorted, apparently, uh, when the coalition came in, DEC was abolished shortly after the Tories won the first time in 2016. Um, and we were amalgamated into what was then the Business Innovation and Skills Department. When we were DEC, uh, we won the London Living Wage for our support staff and we were based in three Whitehall Place, so just down at Trafalgar Square end of Whitehall. And then as, as the department formed, we uh, merged with Biz and moved into one Victoria Street. Um, and Biz was the one who had the legacy contracts. Um, one of the things we were very clear as ex-deckers is we'd said to our permanent secretary we want no one moving into that building until everyone is on the London living wage it was something quite deck people were quite proud of we were quite pleased that no one was on serious poverty wages in deck um, and that didn't happen so we're now talking about 2017 um, the department so then Bayes uh, re-tendered out the contracts without any discussion. So PCS is the um, recognised trade union for the civil service. There's two other unions, but we are the biggest. We're the sixth biggest in the UK. 
Um, so we have recognition with Bayes and they retendered out the contracts without discussion with the departmental trade union side. So you can imagine I was pretty furious. Um, we already had a few members, but I'd say relatively small. We had a couple of members in catering, a couple of members in security and cleaning, not very many, and in the post room, sorry. And the account contractor originally was ONGI, not ISS. And so how we started was, it was really key to build trust. Um, of course, we were trying to recruit more, but of course, as Mark, I think is detailed and as many of you will probably know being workplace reps, you know, you go, we have the same problem in the civil service. You go and talk about joining the union and people are like, well, I don't really have an issue and sort of what is a trade union? Um, and so, and this is only amplified with the majority of our um, ISS workers in particular, but also our mark being migrant workers of which English is not their first language. Um, and so aren't necessarily familiar with the UK trade union landscape, although actually quite a few of them are trade unionists from their own countries, Ecuador or wherever it may be. Um, and so it was quite key for us, for them to show we weren't just all talk, we did stuff. So of course we did the standard stuff like leafleting and talking, but we did do stuff like Bayes and the civil service have these kind of away days and big events where all the civil servants go. So we went and picketed them um, and caused a big kerfuffle, uh, embarrassed the hell out of the secretary of state and permanent secretary and said, oh, look, look at all you white people having a nice little meeting. I don't see any of our cleaners here. I don't see any of our security here. Um, and just generally made a real nuisance of ourselves, uh, much to the delight of my department, um, and, and did lots of things like that so that our support staff could see we weren't just talk, we would do stuff and we were serious um, and we would take action. So then we put in our formal pay claims um, and moved to uh, strike action because no surprise, Onji and Aramark did not respond. Um, to be fair, they were both a little bit better and they were bound by the fact that unless Bayes is going to pay, they don't really have much wriggle room um, because they want to make their profit and they're not going to cut into their profit to uh, increase terms and conditions and wages for workers. So our first strikes in January 2019 were actually quite small. It was only about 10, 12 workers in total. Um, but as it started to grow, and we didn't be bound by the fact that waiting for a critical mass of lots of workers to join, more and more workers could start to see PCS would have their back, that we would fight if their employer tried to take action against them, that we, we, that we would put ourselves on the line as well, because they knew better for our employer. Um, and more people started to join. So by the time ISS came in to Bayes, which was on the 1st of March 2019, um, we had quite a large contingent then of workers. Um, ISS, we had to obviously resubmit our pay claim to ISS to re-establish the dispute. ISS dismissed our pay claim in its totality, would not discuss any element of it. Um, a lot of you will be familiar that then ISS completely did not pay all their workers for probably about a three month period of which Bayes was subject to that. So we were then in crisis mode. Um, we took the extraordinary step of um, setting up food banks and I put a food bank right outside the Secretary of State's office so he couldn't walk out the office without falling over it. Uh, we put posters up, obviously because we are the recognised trade union for the civil service, we could mobilise the anger of the civil service um, and we were handing out cash and food to our workers to keep them over. Bayes felt that pressure, mobilising our civil service members and um, obviously, we went to the media and the front bench of the Labour Party at the time were incredibly supportive. Um, and Bayes really felt the pressure and moved myself and many other reps over onto full time uh, facility time. If anyone knows what's happened to PCS over the years, it's pretty much unheard of these days um, because we had to rewrite their whole payroll system for them. They just were completely unable to do it. And they lied throughout. They told Bayes 
that it was a minor amount of people. And because we were so connected to the workers every day, we could show bays that they were lying um, and that it was systemic across the piece. And so bays were furious with them, is to say the least. Um, so I think wrong wording, but that helped quite a bit. And obviously we were on the ground to make sure that, you know, people did have money and, and that they could eat. Um, I think it's fair to say then our membership sort of skyrocketed, skyrocketed. So we are now close to nearly 100% on both contracts. Um, when we'd re-established the disputes, the, the strikes really kicked off then from March. Um, and we took out different workers, different groups of workers um, and balloted them separately um, so that we could make sure we were taking them out at the most disruptive times. Um, Bays had real problems. Uh, at the times when the strikes were on, there was absolutely no catering and the cleaning stacked up um, uh, and various things. We also, every single thing ISS did, we reacted quickly and speedily. Speed was of the essence. So they handed out leaflets trying to uh, stop people from striking and our lawyers got onto it straight away and wrote to Bayes. We directed everything at Bayes. So we said, we don't even care about ISS. This is all on you. This is your contractor. You sort it out. Um, and so our lawyers wrote to the permanent secretary, which obviously stopped um, letters going out to try and union bust. Um, and bear in mind, all of these laws that ISS were breaking, whether it was unlawful deductions of wages, various other things, pay slips, etc. Uh, there's a whole list of laws ISS break. They are all base laws. So we also made it very clear to base this is personally difficult for you. Um, obviously, HSE is, is tangentially, and so is um, the Equalities Commission tangentially associated with Bayes as well. And Bayes has some connection to those areas of law as well. Um, and so uh, when we got to strikes in May and June, um, we had all the workers out. Um, parts of Bayes were closed, um, the conference centre was closed down, restaurants were closed down. We had quite a lot of industrial power. Um, one of the things we also did, and it, it was learning from some of the new unions like UVW and IWGB, was to be brave. Um, so one of the things that absolutely drove our Secretary of State up the wall was Vuvuzelas. All our workers had Vuvuzelas and we'd blast them right outside their office to disrupt meetings and just be an absolute pain in the neck. Um, and using the media make it kind of impossible for Bayes to really do anything. Um, I think they did try to call the police a couple of times, but that didn't go down very well. Um, we also did things like cookouts. We had really big cookouts, Jamaican cookouts on the picket line, because obviously all the catering was closed. One, to raise money for the picket line, but to get the civil service involved, come, speak, get involved, talk to our workers. Um, and our picket lines kind of kept, became a bit notorious for being quite lively, to say the least, um, and quite innovative. Um, and other things we did were things like we did, we took the picket line to the then Secretary of State Greg Clark's constituency um, and handed out leaflets, making it look like they were Tory party leaflets, but telling his constituents exactly what he was up to and they weren't best pleased uh, and campaigning in his constituency and that really wound him up. Um, uh, and doing things like disrupting his speeches so we knew where he was going to go and do a speech. Um, and particularly, we were particularly proud of ruining his big announcement on the Taylor Review and the Good Work Plan um, and getting into the media about the fact that, well, you've just announced the Good Work Plan, but all your workers are on strike. So how's that going for you? And that really annoyed him. Um, so being fast uh, and, and being um, jumping on those political moments, I think, really worked well for us and, and the Labour front bench were amazing. Um, it was raised in PMQ several times. Um, Rebecca Longbaby, who was then shadow secretary of state for Bayes, phoned up Greg Clark and, and berated him on what was going on in his department. So that worked really well. Then come July last year, 
We pulled out all our catering and cleaning ultimately on indefinite all-out strike action, the first indefinite all-out strike action in Whitehall, we believe. Um, and that's when Bayes really were like, oh God. Um, uh, and then it really started to move. And to be clear, when we were in negotiations, ISS were not even in the room. We negotiated purely with Bayes because all of this we directed at Bayes. We didn't even acknowledge ISS. We said, we don't care. We don't care. We have no interest in speaking to these liars and idiots. This is your contract. You pay for it. You're responsible for them. You sit in a room and you negotiate. Um, and at the end of it, we won. Um, all our workers now are on, as a minimum, the London living wage, but actually quite a few are on higher. Um, they have 20 days sick leave, uh, occupational sick leave, um, and they have higher sort of tailored to how many years they've worked um, holiday. We also won from our permanent secretary a proper discussion about in-housing, 18 months out of the end of the contracts. Um, and um, we also won the principle that actually ISS were a bit of a mess. Um, and that it wasn't great. During the negotiations, when Bayes would go to get information from ISS to assist in the negotiations, they lied continually. Um, and it annoyed Bayes, to say the least. So I think we have a, a good relationship with Bayes, Bayes and have managed to ensure that Bayes have a bad relationship with ISS. So that's good. Uh, that was a job. One thing we didn't get overly bothered about was recognition. I think there is sometimes a bit of a danger, and, and PCS were just as, as liable of this, of chasing recognition. We didn't need recognition. We had recognition with Bayes, and that was what was the important thing. I don't care about sitting in a room with ISS. I just want them out of Bayes. I don't really want to talk to them, to be quite frank. And it's Bayes that controlled all elements of the terms and conditions of those workers and the health and safety. So I don't really care what ISS have to say. And recognition doesn't... I mean, it's all wrong, but it doesn't really do that much, to be honest, especially with someone like ISS that, you know, are not exactly known for telling the truth. Um, so, so that's where we're up to. Um, I think the other thing that I'd really say is we followed through on everything, literally everything. So if ISS made an agreement, we did not think that they were going to follow through on it. We checked with our workers. We then knew that they hadn't done what they said they do. And we made Bayes make them do it. Um, we saw that a lot in the pay crisis. So there was nothing that we ever believed ISS on. And we made Bayes uh, take action. Uh, and that's also left us in a position where now we win quite easily. So we launched uh, pay claims. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and we said we want all of our workers paid a bonus, and we want it a 25% uplift. Bayes basically straight away said, yeah, uh, we're now in negotiations to sort that out, because they know we have industrial power, and they know that we will see it through. We won't forget about it. We won't just put in demands and then disappear. We will pull them out on strike, and they will all come out on strike as well. Um, and so they know, and Bayes is also hosting all the trade negotiations in our conference centre, so they know that that's probably not a, a road to go down with us. Uh, so we are now negotiating on bonuses, which will be the first bonuses for contracted out staff across Whitehall. Um, and Bayes have agreed they won't wait for Cabinet Office to decide we will do it in Bayes and then Cabinet Office can catch up later on. We did the same thing when the pandemic started on the 28th of February. We put in demands to Bayes on that everyone should be paid, that we want people sent home and sent home now. We want um, any COVID um, suspected not to be treated as sick because while they have 20 days leave, 20 days leave is not actually very much. Um, so we want them just paid in full. Um, we want people that have childcare sent home and paid in full. Um, Bayes agreed to it all before Whitehall because they knew if you don't, you know what you're going to get from us. Um, and they know that we have media contacts and we will use them if necessary. Um, so now we're at a stage where we're negotiating on bonuses um, and we have most of our workers shielding at home. Um, we are also now entering into negotiations to talk about in-housing. 
Um, and because of all the work and following through on absolutely every single minute amount of detail, making everything pin to base, we are in a place where um, I think those in-housing conversations are largely accepted that perhaps outsourcing is not a very good thing. We did a lot of work, our analysts, with the support of Mark as well um, on the financial state of the market that this is a risky market for the government to be buying into. Um, obviously, we had InterServe go bust, but Bayes was also responsible for the clear up of Carillion. So Bayes do know the mess that is created by these companies. Um, so we are now starting those negotiations on talking about bringing our workers back in-house. And, and to be honest, the COVID thing has really highlighted what we've been saying for a long time. At the moment, Bayes is paying 100% on the contracts, despite the fact that we are obviously don't need all the services and all the services aren't happening. So they're paying a profit margin for absolutely no reason. You wouldn't need to. You don't need to pay salaries. And actually, because Bayes is one of the departments quite responsible for COVID and pandemic um, response. Actually, we could have used some of those workers if they were back as civil servants um, in helping us in that pandemic response um, and, and not be siloed away. So a couple of, just a couple of very quick reflections um, because I've spoken enough. Um, my reflections is be brave. Um, we, we are civil servants. Civil servants are not exactly known for being brave and we got away with a hell of a lot. Uh, partly because we got in a position where Beige just couldn't have taken action against any of us reps because it was just too awkward. All civil servants knew about it. They all supported us. It was in the media. It was just like, oh, we just don't want this hassle. So if we can do it in the civil service and get away with it, you can do it elsewhere. Be braver. Uh, be fast and capitalise on the moment. You have to be really, really quick. Um, there's no point putting out a statement three months after the event. We were fast. We managed to get Bay's policy annou announcements ruined by being fast and not waiting. Uh, we mobilised our workers, so our civil service workers to support, so they've been inundating the permanent secretary and the secretary of state with the fact that they don't like this um, criteria. We've also got in a position now where the permanent secretary is going to meet with our support staff to hear about structural racism because continually throughout this we have said outsourcing is the most obvious example of structural racism in the civil service. All of my workers, all of my members are people of colour or migrant workers working in outsourcing, whereas the civil service is largely white. Um, and that is not a position that we are prepared to be in. Um, and so that has made senior management uh, not feel very comfortable and they are now going to meet with, with all our workers to hear the effects of structural racism. A couple of reflections as the wider uh, trade union movement. I'm not sure, and this isn't um, because we think we're great, um, but one of the things that was very clear to us is Bayes and ISS were really worried about the precedent our dispute set. Bayes were worried about the precedent across government. ISS were actually worried about the precedent across, our, across their business, particularly on sick pay. Um, and so I'm not sure as a trade union movement we capitalise on it uh, enough on it, because if they were worried about it, we should have seen that as something to set a precedent. Bayes is the government department responsible for workers' rights and trade union law and all sorts of different things. And if they thought it was going to set a precedent, we should have made sure it set a precedent as the trade union movement. Um, I think we can do more coordination. Um, we've managed to get ISS uprated to Amber on the strategic suppliers list of cabinet office. So they are no longer green by demonstrating that this company is not in a very viable financial position and cabinet office accepted our analysis on that. But I think we can do more as a trade union movement. We've built a model to demonstrate that in-housing is cheaper um, that we can share with the trade union movement because it's probably applicable across the piece. I think we can do more on legal coordination in terms of we're looking at the UBW cases on equality that they've launched at tribunals, um, but also on Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act and how much supervision um, clients need to have of their undertaking. The, other things is ISS is actually a recognised service provider 
for the legal uh, for the Living Wage Foundation. We should get the Living Wage Foundation to kick them out. At no point did they ever bid for the base contract for the living wage. They also would not support it. So they should be removed and as a union movement, we should remove them. A final thought, a very final thought was on um, Mark's comments about the amount of businesses in the facilities management. He's absolutely right. I don't know whether the trade union movement have ever thought about um, trade union co-ops. Why don't we do it? We'd be a better employer um, and we would be a better route. Um, it's a bit like we've talked about with trade union school. Uh, why haven't we got trade union schools? Should we have trade union co-ops providing these services? Um, so that is my thoughts and I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank, thank, thanks ever so much, Kate. I mean, that, that, I mean, it's a fantastic story to hear. Clearly, the, the, you know, the kind of innovation, the being on the front foot, the kind of challenge uh, to, uh, uh, to to government as an employer as well as a uh, as a client of contracting and and really getting in in their grill to kind of persuade them that they have a role in uh, in, in kind of um, benchmarking good standards uh, for workers whether they're directly employed uh, or not and I think it's just always great in the trade union movement to hear of wins in our movement we have so many uh, defeats don't we I think we're you know proving that we can win and win well uh, is always wonderful to uh, to hear. Uh, we've got a, a couple of questions and we've got like literally uh, six minutes to kind of respond uh, to them. Uh, one is, uh, I think, directed towards uh, you, Kate, and that's around uh, the, the, the lessons around uh, some of the kind of experiences of merging around uh, the, the kind of civil service departments, which I, I suspect is from one of your PCS colleagues currently working uh, in DFID going through the merger. Uh, with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And Mark, there was a question to you around how we can kind of, uh, if you like, share the, the, the kind of positive experiences when there are so many uh, kind of uh, workplaces you describe in so many countries. How can we kind of unify, if you like, that winning experience and share good practice? And then I think there's almost uh, a question that I would like to ask, uh, particularly I think, well, to both of you really, but I think uh, primarily to uh, to Katie, and that's uh, what's next for us as a TUC, because ISS is one organisation with all of these companies. There are so many others like them. How can we kind of build on this campaign, build on this success, and win for those workers right across the economy? So I'll maybe go to Mark first, and then to you, Katie, and if we could keep the uh, answers reasonably brief, because we, we do need to be off the call by two. So Mark. Yeah, so thanks for Kate's great presentation on uh, what what they did at the base. And I think what we, in I was working a lot of the time in the background, like trying to get solidarity messages from Finland and Denmark and uh, getting the European Works Council, like to send letters to central management. And that's a small part of like what, you know, Uni can do to, you know, like to help uh, even in individual workplace uh, disputes. But I think that it did have a positive effect for the cleaners who were actually on strike and said, hey, like there, we have international solidarity. And on the other hand, I also think that the exchange between the PCS branch at base and us was also fruitful because we actually started talking about like what kind of strategies can work and Kate outlined like how they targeted Bayes and said like these are cleaners at Bayes uh, and so I think that's very that's very important. In terms of going forward I think the thing is is that uh, we try to publish a ISS trade union newsletter with good stories uh, every couple of months and it's my responsibility to manage that newsletter and collect stories and I will send out emails uh, trying to get people to, you know, uh, to send me their stories. So, you know, if I think we should get that back off the ground uh, and hear from, you know, like, uh, especially the British unions, as well as uh, the global unions and get that uh, kick started again to share some of the good uh, victories. And I think at the second, and I think at a very concrete level is, is like going forward, we really need to think about like, how do we, you know, like how do we raise the standards across the entire sector, right? Because there's so many companies and they're always undercutting each other. They think they can get away with it. And unless there are strong unions, 
they will get away they will get away with it so i think that the trade union combine and trade union alliance between pcs pmb unison uh, and unite and uh, and the rmt and the work that kevin has been doing you know behind behind the scenes of getting all these unions together into one room i think the question now is, is like okay like how do we get you know like some kind of like sectoral kind of like benchmarks of like these are the goals we actually want for our cleaners whether they're in the private sector or in the pu in the public sector and try to go and try to get some big contract uh, good client signed up to uh, signed up to an agenda uh, for cleaners and some of the lowest paid workers in our economies and brilliant thank you mark and uh, in two minutes katie right two minutes very happy I'm to talk about merger um Perhaps we'll talk about that separately, um, about mergers. We went through many. Um, uh, what next? So I think there's a real moment coming up. The UK is going to be COP26 presidency. There is a lot of talk about just transition and quality jobs. The UK does not have any legislation. And in fact, it very much looks like the employment bill that's going to come in is not is actually going to roll back workers' rights. Um, obviously, we will no longer, from January, be part of the European Works Councils either. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. So there is a moment uh, where we can mobilise next year because we know the, the, the poorest and people of colour and migrant workers are on the front line of climate change and the world is going to be looking at the UK. And Alex Sharma, who is COP26 president, and the PM has made various statements about sustainable green future, quality jobs. There is no quality jobs, so just imagine, because they're in the green economy. We know the, the renewable sector, for, in, for instance, is rife with gig economy, zero hours, um, and at one point was using slave migrant labour um, up in uh, the, on the wind farms. And so there is a real moment to get a real focus on these companies like ISS, where they are driving down standards, where they have zero sick pay and are paying minimum wage and minimum standards, and actually quite often systemically are violating the law by using that COP26 moment and saying you cannot keep talking about quality jobs, sustainable green future, when you have no legislation that will enable that. We do not have collective sectorial bargaining. We don't have um, high quality workers' rights. And it, obviously, if you've seen the ITUC's global index, we've now been downrated. Um, so that's nice. Um, and so I think there needs to be a far more focus and pressure put on because the government are really worried about looking bad for COP26. And there's a real moment next year when we can apply full pressure um, and have a lot more industrial weight, um, particularly if we warn them that, we'll, that Glasgow will go out on strike during the COP if they don't get their act together. So it would be good to work with, the, with Unison and GMB in Glasgow to start mobilising, um, because if the government thinks that their COP is going to be ruined in front of everyone, they will not like that. So making those links uh, with, with other moments is really key, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, and, and the message I'm hearing from today is one, uh, that there's a lot of intelligence about what we know about how companies uh, operate that exposes how and uh, you know they, uh, they they exploit workers through very kind of uh, you know clever kind of modern capitalist uh, ways but that actually if we stand up to them if we fight them if we get in their faces and if we work together well uh, that we can win and win for workers for me that's a really really optimistic message but the, I think you know it's not a, a message just of hope it's a message of hope fight and win can I thank very much uh, Mark and Katie for uh, joining us today. Thank everybody for their uh, participation in the events. Thank Craig for the support uh, and wish everybody well uh, for the rest of the weekend and for continuing to win this fight for workers. All the best, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye.